Welcome back to the Fulton County Gospel News Podcast. My name is Barry O'Dell, and I am your host. Fulton County Gospel News is a bi-monthly publication that is put out by the Church of Christ in Mammoth Spring, Arkansas. If you'd like to learn more about the paper, visit our website, mammothspringchurchofchrist.com, and you'll be able to find all the pertinent information regarding that paper. You can subscribe to it uh, free of charge. You can receive it through email and PDF format. You can receive it through the United States Postal Service free of charge as well whatever you'd like to do. All of our contact information is on the website. You can shoot us an email, uh, contact us on Facebook through our Facebook page. We actually have two. One of them is called Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring, and the other is called Fulton County Gospel News. So if you're interested in the paper, get a hold of us, and we'll be more than happy to, to get it to you. We're going to talk about something today that is, that is often a topic of discussion surrounding salvation, and that is this concept of calling upon the name of the Lord. We actually find this phrase a few times in the Bible, and we're going to focus in on two or three today and try to figure out what exactly does this mean. You know, to a lot of folks, calling on the name of the Lord is the concept of of basically accepting Christ into one's heart as their personal Savior and then saying the sinner's prayer. And when we do that, we we are now children of God, we're saved, and we can be baptized sometime, sometime later, maybe a special Sunday baptismal service or something like that. But that's kind of a, I guess I would say, a very brief summation of calling upon the name of the Lord. And so let's look at the Scriptures, and let's see if that's exactly what the Bible talks about or if that's what the Bible means when it talks about calling upon the name of the Lord. So in the New Testament, we read this phrase in Acts chapter 2 and verse 21. Now, of course, the context here is the first Pentecost after the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This is the Feast of Pentecost in the city of Jerusalem. Uh, You can learn more about that in Leviticus chapter 23. But this is in Acts 2 and verse 21. This is part of a quote, actually, from the Old Testament. Peter's preaching on that day, and he tells the audience, what you guys are listening to, what you're seeing and hearing today, is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And that's Acts chapter 2 and verse 16. And so part of that prophecy was, as recorded again in Acts 2.21, And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now here's the good thing about this, because Peter's preaching starts there in verse Really, his speaking begins, it's recorded in Acts 2, beginning in verse 14, and he goes, and it's recorded down through verse 36. Well, you get to Acts 2 and verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Now keep in mind, they've already been told, and it shall come to pass that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men and brethren, verse 37, what shall we do? Well, here's here's Peter's response to that, Acts 2 and verse 38. Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so it's pretty straightforward right there in Acts chapter 2. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What shall we do? Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. So we see right there that, that calling on the name of the Lord is not just an it's not just a verbal exclamation that one makes. It's not just saying, Jesus, I love you, I know I'm a sinner, I accept you into my heart, and I want you to be my savior. Because you know, frankly, that's I guess in summation, that's what most people say the sinner's prayer is. You acknowledge your You acknowledge your sinfulness, you confess that Christ is Lord, and then you confess your need for salvation, and you tell him that that you now accept him into your heart. Peter says nothing of the sort there in Acts chapter 2. In fact, and and I tell you, so if you write in the margin of your Bible, sometimes there there are good things to do to help you, uh, just for quick reference, a a verse that you might write next to Acts chapter 2 and verse 21 is, is found back in Matthew chapter 7. I'm going to turn my Bible real quick back to Matthew chapter 7. It's the uh, Sermon on the Mount, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 20, verse 21. Matthew 7, 21. Jesus speaking says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. 
Many will say to me in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So when Peter says in Acts 2 and verse 21, and whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, you can couple that with Matthew 7 and verse 21 in particular, but really verses 21 through 23, because that passage tells us it's not enough just to say, Lord, Lord. It's not enough just to, as we're told, just to claim him in your heart as your personal Savior. Remember what they said there uh, on the day of Pentecost. What shall we do? You need to repent and be baptized. So that's one passage, Acts chapter 2 and verse 21. But here's another one. And this is found in Acts chapter 22. I'm turning my Bible over there real quick. And we're actually going to put a couple of verses together here as well. So what we have going on in Acts chapter 22, Peter, or rather Paul has been arrested. He's been in the temple uh, in the city of Jerusalem. He's been arrested and he's given a chance to address the crowd of people who have arrested him and surrounded him. And so what he does is he recounts his conversion to Christianity and what happened when Ananias came to him and preached the gospel to him. So Acts 22 and verse, let me see here. I'll just start in verse 16. Now I tell you what, I'll start in Acts 22, I'll start in verse 12. Then a certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me. And he stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that same hour I looked up, looked up at him. Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you, that you should know his will, and see the just one, and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So there again is that concept of calling on the name of the Lord. Now remember, and, and by the way, I'm turning back to Acts chapter 9. What we just read there in Acts, uh, Acts chapter 22 is Paul recounting what happened to him uh, after Jesus confronted him on the road to Damascus and, and Ananias came and, and preached to him. And, and what we're told there is, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. So let's, let's just formulate this for just a minute. So a lot of people tell us that calling on the name of the Lord is is to say some form of the sinner's prayer, to confess your sinfulness, to confess your need for a Savior, and, and again, to, to verbalize your acceptance of Jesus Christ. It's interesting, when you go back to Acts chapter 9, and you actually read the account of when all of this was taking place, we find Saul confronted by Jesus, Acts chapter 9, and let's see, it goes really goes down through verse 9, the confrontation there. So listen to Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 7. The men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. So he's blind, and he's fasting during this time. Now, as you get to Acts chapter 9 and verse 10, the scene shifts to Ananias. Now, there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. Now, listen to this. This is Acts 9 and verse 11. For behold, he is praying. Okay, so he's three days without sight, and he's fasting, verse 9. And then you get down to verse 11, and he's praying. So as Paul as is recounting these events in Acts chapter 22 and verse 16, he, uh, he tells us that Ananias came to him, preached the gospel to him, told him what God was going to use him for, and then Ananias just comes out and tells him, What are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized, washing away your sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. So we jump back to Acts chapter 9. Ananias comes to him. Ananias speaks to him. And you start reading again in Acts chapter 9. And let's see here. I'll start in verse 17. And Ananias went his way and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, 
The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. See, calling on the name of the Lord is not praying. Saul had been doing that until Ananias got there. Saul had been fasting. Saul was struck blind by the Lord. And yet, when Ananias got there, remember Acts twenty two sixteen, his message to Saul was, What are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. Now listen, that fits absolutely perfectly with Acts chapter 2 and verse 21. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved with Acts 2 and verse 38. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. See, that's what it means to call upon the name of the Lord. It's not a prayer. It's not the sinner's prayer. It's not uh, verbalizing that you're a sinner, although you need to do that in order to be saved, obviously. It's not verbalizing that you're a sinner and that you need Jesus in your heart. In fact, it's so interesting to me that the, the phraseology that's even used in terms of the sinner's prayer and asking Jesus into your heart, that is nowhere found in Scripture. Uh, no one was ever told to pray for salvation. The closest thing that comes to it, and I'm turning my Bible over to Revelation chapter 3, the closest thing that comes to to this concept of inviting Jesus into your heart is found in Revelation chapter 3. And let me see if I can find it here real quick. Hmm. Okay, Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Jesus speaking says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Well, so that's, you know, some people take Revelation 3 and verse 20. Well, there's the sinner's prayer. You have to invite Jesus into your heart. Well, here's the problem. Jesus is talking to Christians here. He's, in fact, he's talking to the church at Laodicea who was in need of repentance. This is the church that had become lukewarm. They were neither hot nor cold. They were absolutely useless. And so he's, he's standing there waiting. He's saying, listen, guys, you need to respond to this message of repentance. And if you do, we, we will have fellowship together. Um, and, and, and you can overcome Revelation 3 and verse 21. But this is not Jesus standing at the heart of a sinner waiting for the sinner to pray. So don't let people use Revelation 3 and verse 20 as a, as a quote-unquote sinner's prayer. So what does it mean to call on the name of the Lord? Always go back to Matthew seven twenty one. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. You know, there's, not, there's, there's no such thing as, as, as name it and claim it in terms of salvation. Anybody can say, Lord, Lord. Well, I tell you what, here's another passage, Luke 6 and verse 46. And why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not those things which I say? It's not enough to verbally say, Jesus, you're my Savior, and I accept you into my heart. We find that nowhere in Scripture. Calling on the name of the Lord means that you're responding to His commands. Calling on the name of the Lord is to do what you're being instructed to do. Such as Peter on the day of Pentecost, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Repent and be baptized. Or Ananias and Saul in Acts chapters 9 and 22. Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. So we can call upon the name of the Lord today, so long as we're obedient to the gospel message of submitting our will to God's, of repenting, of being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. That's what it means to call upon the name of the Lord. All right, folks, thanks for listening today. I hope this podcast has been helpful to you today. Uh, if it is, uh, I would encourage you to like, share, subscribe. We're on Podbean, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Fulton County Gospel News podcast is what it's called. Share this on social media because our only goal here at, at the Mammoth Spring Church of Christ and the Fulton County Gospel News is to get God's Word out to as many people as possible in as many different formats as possible. So thank you so much for listening and I hope you have a good day 
and keep on studying the Word of God, and we will catch you on the next episode.